This is Reason Revolution. I am your host, Justin Clark. Thank you for joining us this week. We have a lot of great and interesting stories to get to later on this evening, but first, I just want to mention again, please check out my two-part interview with Justin Scott, who is the director of Eastern Iowa Atheists. We had a very long and very interesting four-hour conversation a couple weeks ago. Um, Those episodes have been out now for about a week. I strongly suggest you go and check those out because they are very, very interesting, and Justin's a real great guy, and I think we had a really great conversation. And if you have any um, ideas about a possible guest for Reason Revolution, please let us know at reasonrevolutionpodcast at gmail.com. Um, also, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and SoundCloud and YouTube. Um, the YouTube version of the podcast usually either goes up the, either the same night as the SoundCloud version or the next day. just depends on how long I want to spend working on something. But they're within days of each other. And then go ahead and give us a follow on Facebook. Give me a follow on Facebook at The Daily Clark. Same with Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr. So let's get into the news stories. These are the short takes. This comes to us from the New York Times. Unwed mothers and fathers may not be treated differently in determining whether their children may claim American citizenship, the Supreme Court ruled on Monday. The gender line Congress drew is incompatible with the requirement that the government accord to all persons the equal protection of the laws, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote for the majority. This comes to us from The Hill Magazine. A federal judge has denied a challenge by Hawaii to expand the family exceptions in President Trump's revised travel ban after the state requested to widen the bona fide relationships needed by refugees from six majority Muslim countries to enter the U.S. to include more relatives. This also comes to us from The New York Times. France is joining a growing movement to force the extinction of vehicles that run on fossil fuels, saying on Thursday that it would aim to end the sale of gasoline and diesel cars by the year 2040. And finally, from the Washington Post, President Donald Trump met with Russian President Vladimir Putin on Friday during the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany. The two spoke about the Syrian war and allegations of Russian meddling in the 2016 election. President Putin denied the cyber attack charges, despite multiple U.S. intelligence agencies confirming Russian intrusions. They also began negotiations of a partial ceasefire in Syria. And those are the short takes. Now on to the main news items. This comes to us from The Atlantic Magazine, and it's by Robert P. Jones, who is the director of the Public Religion Research Institute. Trump can't reverse the decline of white Christian America. Two-thirds of those who voted for the president felt his election was the last chance to stop America's decline, but his victory won't arrest the cultural and demographic trends they opposed. So this is a very interesting article about the demographic changes that are facing the country and the fact that Donald Trump in many ways sort of played to those. Post-election polling from the Public Religion Research Institute, this is the article now, and The Atlantic showed that this appeal found its mark among conservative voters. Um, Nearly two-thirds, 66% of Trump voters, compared to only 22% of Clinton voters, agreed that the 2016 election represented the last chance to stop America's decline. There's some other really interesting stories in here that I think speaks volumes about what really changed this election in some respects. So I'm going to be quoting again from the article here. Out of more than 136 million votes cast, Trump's victory in the Electoral College came down to a razor-thin edge of only 77,744 votes across three states. Pennsylvania, 44,292, Wisconsin, 22,748, and Michigan, 10,704. These votes represent a Trump margin of 0.7 percentage points in Pennsylvania, 0.7 percentage points in Wisconsin, and 0.2 percentage points in Michigan. If Clinton had won these states, she would now be president. And of course, Clinton actually won the popular vote by 2.9 million votes, receiving 48.2% of all votes compared to Trump's 46.1%. The real story of 2016 is that there was just enough movement in just the right places, just enough increased turnout from just the right groups to get Trump the electoral votes he needed to win. And so Jones is making a very interesting argument here, which is that the demographic changes of the country are 
going to happen. That the religiously unaffiliated is close to 23% now. Um, that's the nuns, as I've mentioned on the podcast before. N-O-N-E-S, not nuns, like in the habit. These are atheists, agnostics, spiritual but not religious, people who don't go to church, and people who flat out just don't give a fuck. Um, these people are becoming a larger sector of the American public, and in particular, the American voting public. But they don't vote like it. But evangelicals do. And so I'm going to quote again from the article about where evangelicals were in the 2008 election and where they were in the 2016 election. So back to the article. Quote, two election cycles ago in 2008, white evangelicals represented 21% of the general population, but thanks to their higher turnout relative to other voters, comprised 26% of actual votes. In 2016, even as their proportion of the population fell to 17%, white evangelicals continued to represent 26% of voters. In other words, white evangelicals went from being overrepresented by 5 percentage points at the ballot box in 2008 to being overrepresented by 9 percentage points at the ballot box in 2016. This is an impressive feat to be sure, but one less and less likely to be replicated as their decline in the general population continues. And what's interesting here is he also has a, a, a really interesting chart showing how as um, support for same-sex marriage is increased in the country, um, the decline of the white Christian demographic has also gone down. Um, and so, um, for example, um, those who identify as white and Christian fell 11 percentage points between 2004 and 2016, whereas support for same-sex marriage jumped 18 percentage points. And a lot of thing, one big question that people have asked a lot in reference to this election is, why did evangelicals go for Trump? And Jones's hypothesis is one that I think has a certain level of credence to it, which is that they went from being moral voters or values voters to becoming nostalgia voters. And so it's a very it's a it's a it's a really drastic change in sort of how they view um, their relationship to sort of conservative politicians. Um, so I'm going to be quoting the, from the article again here. Trump's campaign, with its sweeping promise to make America great again, triumphed by converting self-described values voters into what I've called nostalgia voters. Trump's promise to restore a mythical past golden age, where factory jobs paid the bills and white Protestant churches were the dominant cultural hubs, powerfully tapped evangelical anxieties about an uncertain future. Um, and one thing that's interesting, too, is that I've been reading, uh, I've been listening to this audiobook by um, American Enterprise Institute scholar Yuval Levin, and it's his book called The Fractured Republic. And he actually makes a very similar argument to Jones in the sense that the 2016 election was a very much about nostalgia. So if you look at what Donald Trump ran on, it was sort of a, you know, the return of American manufacturing and the return of sort of white evangelical Protestantism at the top, right? And then Hillary Clinton's campaign sort of wanted to create a new sort of American progressivism that was rooted in sort of, um, you know, coalitional identity politics and economic fairness. So sort of hearkening back to LBJ's Great Society as well as the Civil Rights Movement. So in many ways, they they really were nostalgic-driven, um, which is no surprise because both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are baby boomers. Baby boomers are the largest um, uh, demographic in the United States, um, which I think is going to be overshadowed, I think, slightly or eventually by the millennial generation, which is what I belong to. I was born in 1990. And the millennial generation, I think, might be a little bit bigger than the boomers. But in terms of voting public, the boomers are still vastly greater. Um, and so he, he goes on and talks about how white evangelical and Protestants, their anxieties about immigration, their anxieties about um, their sort of misguided view of Muslim people, um, and, and, and how they're not particularly comfortable with some of these changes. So 64% favored a U.S. border wall with Mexico, 62% favored temporary, temporarily banning Muslims from other countries, 63% believe that today's discrimination against whites has, be, has become as big a problem as discrimination against other minorities, um, and they think that American culture has changed for worse, 51% over that, which is better. White evangelical Protestants 
in the broader term, think that 74% of them think that things are worse uh, in terms of cultural and, and demographic changes than they were in the 1950s. So Trump's appeal to the white evangelicals wasn't so much rooted in who he was, right? It wasn't because they could have gone with somebody like a Ted Cruz. They could have gone with somebody like Rick Santorum, um, who's written very much about, you know, being sort of white um, Protestant ethics, although Santorum is a Catholic, but of that sort of waspy, you know, kind of notion or, or sort of a blue collar conservatism. Ted Cruz is the same way. I mean, he comes from the Southern Baptist Convention background. His father is a minister. You would think that that would matter to them. But in reality, they didn't sell the idea of nostalgia in the way that Donald Trump did. And that's what made him so much more successful because he was sort of promising them something that they really, really wanted. And they he also promised them uh, the the things that evangelicals wanted, like a conservative on the Supreme Court that he would roll back, you know, funding for Planned Parenthood, these these kinds of things. He was playing all of the conservative evangelical notes, if you will, but he was also playing into the nostalgia. So, sort of traditional evangelical conservative politics is one thing. You add all of that and add in that sort of nature of like nostalgia, and that really pulled people out to the polls, particularly white evangelicals. Um, and so, you know, he won, and I think I've mentioned this before on either Reason Revolution or another podcast that, you know, Trump won um, the largest percentage of evangelical voters. Uh, in recent memory. Um, you know, for example, I'm trying to pull up the article here. Um, in the 2016 election, Donald Trump won 80% of um, white evangelical voters. Contrast that to George W. Bush and sort of the values voters drenched election of 2004 when he only won 78%. So Trump really was playing into um, what Jones kind of calls in the article the evangelical sort of re real, real politic in the sense that they really knew what they wanted out of government in terms of an evangelical sort of theocratic agenda. And they were very okay with backing somebody who may be sort of morally problematic, but politically hits all the right notes. But the other thing I think that Jones sort of makes a point of is the fact that like this is not going to last forever. And so, you know, his final paragraph here, I'm going to be quoting from the article now. Meanwhile, the major trends transforming the country continue. If anything, evangelicals deal if anything, evangelicals deal with Trump may accelerate the very changes it was designed to, to arrest, as a growing number of non-white and non-Christian Americans are repulsed by the increasingly nativist tribal tenor of both conservative white Christianity and conservative white politics. At the end of the day, white evangelicals' grand bargain with Trump will be unable to hold back the sheer weight of cultural change, and their descendants will be left with the only real move possible, acceptance. And I think that's a fair point, in the sense that our country is really changing in dramatic ways. Um, we're changing dramatically economically. You know, I always joke with people like, people who have sort of blue-collar manufacturing jobs, they have they shouldn't be really be worried about like a foreigner taking their job. They should really be worrying about a robot taking their job. The other trend that I know that Yuval Levin has written about, and I know that Charles Murray has written about, I think fairly presciently, is the fact that over a fifth of um, non-college educated males in the United States are unemployed. And that's been a trend that's been going on for years and years and years. There's also a widening degree gap that's taken place over the last 15, 16 years in regards to male college graduates versus female college graduates. There are more female college graduates in the United States today than there are male. So there are going to be wide swaths of males, some of which are probably white most of which may be white, who are uneducated uh, or undereducated and are not able to compete in the global economy. And because of that, there's going to be, I think, widespread cultural and social anxieties because the, the economy may be working for many or for most, but there's a sector that's strong enough that it's not working for them. 
and couple that with the social anxieties. So there's a part of the country who sees a world, gra you know, rapidly changing. That by like 20, I think either it's like 2030 or by 2050, um, the United States is going to be a majority minority nation, and that white people will not be the majority anymore. And I don't have a problem with that because it doesn't matter to me. But it is a huge shift in terms of the American sort of social fabric is going to change dramatically. And I think in many good ways. I mean, I think that diversity and inclusion and tolerance are the way to go. Um, and I don't support the nativism uh, or the, the sort of backwardness or the racism that often per, per, sort of pervades the conservative evangelical framework. Not everybody, but some. But I do think it's important that we acknowledge that these, these social changes are going to be drastic. And the question is, is will we as a culture, will we as a society be able to um, create a framework by which we deal with this? And then, you know, what is it going to be? Is it going to be good public policy? Is it going to be a new commitment to civic activity? You know, there are going to be just widespread changes in, in our culture and in our society and in our economy. And I don't know if we're ready to really deal with them yet. The other thing I think that we're not ready to deal with yet is the fact that there is a vast amount of people who, who are unchurched, um, who are non-religious. And I mean, I'm an atheist and this show is about atheism and secularism and how it relates to the news and free thought. And I think that people abandoning religion is a good thing. Having said that, I do think that there needs to be a set of cultural and civic institutions that make up for what churches have traditionally done in terms of the forms of fellowship and or community uh, and sort of mutual aid societies, whatnot. And we're also becoming a country that's diffusing more. We're individualizing more. We're, we're, we're fragmenting more. Some of that development is good and some of that development is bad. The question is, is how are we going to be able to deal with that? And in some respects, the argument that Jones is making, and, and I would agree, is that Trump's election was a, re, was a result of those growing anxieties that sort of a neoliberal elite, that, 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 you know, that people like Hillary Clinton or the Democratic Party as a whole, or even, even the Republican Party, didn't really understand it didn't really have a way to address it. And so it's, it's you know, Trump is going to be, I think, an aberration. I think he's one of those things where it's like the last gasp of a generation trying or a demographic trying to figure out where it fits within the scheme of modern American life. Um, and, you know, it, I would be very hard pressed to see if something like this could happen again in the future. But who knows? You know, we're always up for speculation. Things could almost certainly change. Let's move on to our next story. This comes to us from Newsweek, and it is about Hobby Lobby. And it's about Hobby Lobby's sort of shady practices in securing Middle East relics from Israel. So this is by Nina Burley, or Burley, from Newsweek. The title is Christian Retailer Hobby Lobby Stole Middle East History to Make a Bible Museum in Washington. So here's a, so I'm going to be quoting from the article now. When Hobby Lobby CEO Steve Green traveled in 2010 to the Holy Land as the biblically minded like call to Israel in a swath of the greater Middle East to inspect and make an offer on what turned out to be 5,500 pieces of looted Iraqi cuneiform and other objects, he was setting off on a mission that continues to this day. And it's about this $800 million Bible Museum, which is right in the heart of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It's actually so close, in fact, um, and uh, Burley makes the ar argument in this article that, um, that domestic and foreign tourists who don't read the fine print will think it's a U.S. government project. And so... Um, U.S. Customs offices in Memphis opened several FedEx packages labeled as handmade tiles from Turkey. These tiles turned out to be thousands of rare cuneiform tablets dating to the Sumerian Babylonian era at the dawn of writing. And so it appears that Steve Green um, uh, obtained these biblical relics or biblical era relics from uh, antiquities dealers in Israel. And after the Iraq war, there was a massive amount of looting that went on in Iraq. And a lot of that stuff hit the black market. And Berlin makes a really great point, which is that um, scholars and historians 
um, and archaeologists who use these materials to help us understand the, the time of the early Middle East or the early Near East, when you rip those artifacts from their context, meaning that you you take them away from the cultural or, or, or social institutions or museum institutions in which they were in, and they don't have any provenance, meaning they don't have any documentation, they don't have any have any uh, proof of whether they're authentic or not. It makes them sort of uh, it makes them sort of um, scholastically worthless, um, in the sense that there's there's really no way to authenticate whether or not they're real. In fact, this is an interesting point. So Dead Sea Scrolls scholar Michael Langlois who was on the Near East Studies faculty at the University of Strasbourg in France, and I'm quoting the article here, told Newsweek last year that he contacted the museum to report what he believed was a forgery in its collection and asked to, ins and to, ask, um, and ask to inspect it. I was told that Green is not interested in finding out whether his scrolls are genuine or not. Langlois says. A spokesman for the museum denied this. So he bought, you know, somewhere of around the lines of like $1.4 million worth of Middle East antiquities, something along those lines, $1.6 million. Um, and that was comprised 5,500 artifacts comprised of cuneiform tablets and bricks, clay bullae, and cylinder seals. Um, he paid a $3 million fine and forfeited ludic objects to the U.S. Department of Justice. And this was after there was um, other uh, forfeiture of assets by the, um, the New York Customs. So it's interesting. So um, David Smalley had uh, on Dogma Debate had a, maybe a few months ago now had a guest on. I think this was back in March, and he had a guest on who talked about how there's going to be a Bible museum in um, in Washington D.C. and and how you know it'd be this big beautiful monument to try to prove the his, historic, scientific, and cultural veracity of the Bible. And Smalley was interested. He's like, oh, this is really cool. You know, I'd like to go and, and maybe I learn something or whatever. He just wanted to know if it was legit, made sure that no public money was going toward it. Well, no public money, as far as we know, is, is going towards this. If there was, it would probably be in maybe the form of like property tax abatements, but that would be it. Um, but I doubt that. I don't have any evidence to suggest that's the case. It might be, but it's probably not. Um, I don't know if it's a nonprofit or not. All I know is that um, eight hundred million dollars of the Greens' money. I mean, this is a fortune worth three million from their Hobby Lobby chain of uh, retail, craft, and art stores. But the fact that they built a, a, a building, which is the largest museum in Washington, D in Washington D.C. Now keep that in mind, and, and that's in terms of square footage. It's the largest museum in Washington D.C. This is a place with the Smithsonian. The, Nat the National Portrait Gallery, the uh, the what's the National Art Museum, which was the Mellon Collection, um, the you know the the Air and Space Museum, the Museum of American History, the Museum of African American History and Culture that was just opened up either last year or the year before. Um, these are all massive cultural institutions which are run either by and then of course just all the monuments in the National Mall. These are run by government agencies. They're they're part of the National Park Service or they're part of the Smithsonian Institution. The fact that a Bible museum, which has nothing to do with either the Smithsonian Institution or the 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 National Park Service or the NEH or the NEA or anything like that, or any kind of institution that's public is within walking distance of the National Mall will give people the, the I think, the misguided view that it's part of the the government and it's not. And so first off, that's kind of where it's shady. And, you know, we've talked on the show before about how Christians don't tend to do things outright. They tend to be weaselly about what they do. And this is, I think, another weaselly way of doing something where you build a giant fucking museum blocks away from the National Mall and probably don't go out of your way to explain to people that it's this like private institution. It's the hobby horse of some fucking art craft retailer douchebag. Um, and, and you know, so there's that. And then on top of all of that, the fact that they wanted to put over 5,500 items of biblical history in there that had been accrued illegally. So like Green didn't like steal them, um, but the people he bought them from either bought them from people who stole them or stole them outright. So they've been seized. He's paid a fine. The artifacts are going back 
to Iraq. They're going to go back, hopefully, to the institutions that they were part of, or they're going to be seized assets, and in which case they probably will never be released to the public, which is sad um, that these, these amazing cultural artifacts um, will either likely not be returned to their home or they will never be used for the public. That's a real bummer um, in terms of biblical history. But, you know, this is what happens when, you know, some crackpot fundamentalist Christian decides that he wants to sort of build a museum to the Bible. And again, I mean, the whole thing is just nutty in the sense that, you know, I like the, the, the video, um, the author of the article, she mentioned in this video for Newsweek that it's like, it's like Disneyland, but for the Bible. It's like Disneyland of the Bible, and that you know the 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 fact and the and the fiction is often very blurry, or the line between fact and fiction is rather blurry. So um, I think that this museum is an absolute travesty. The Bible is not an historical document. It's not a scientific uh, document. It's a theological document. It's a piece of literature for sure. And without question, uh, its influence on the world is, is, I mean, is not debatable here. But what is debatable is the fact that they're going to build this giant museum. And it doesn't help that one of the ways they were going to stock the museum was with um, looted artifacts. So hopefully this sort of uh, gets people to think about this museum as a huge problem. Maybe the free thought movement, maybe American atheists or other organizations may protest its opening. Um, and if it finds out that any public money went to the institution, they should definitely, definitely protest it and find some way to make them either pay their fair share in taxes or to shut them down if they violate the law. Um, but it's just, it's just another story of a crazy theocrat trying to do crazy shit and it blowing up in his face. And that's pretty great. You know, I, I you know, there's nothing that pleases me more than when a theocrat doesn't get what they want. Let's move on to the last story of the main news items. This comes to us from the Outline magazine online, and it's by Yvette Dentremont, who is awesome. Um, she's also known as the Psy Babe. You should definitely give her a follow on Facebook. Check out her awesome, awesome interview with Joe Rogan that he had last week. This is how I found out about this piece I'm gonna be sharing with you. Um, her, his interview with her is really, really good because Joe, I mean, I love Joe Rogan. I don't always agree with him, but I love him. I think he gives great interviews. I think he's very fair with people. And he asked her, I think, fairly tough questions. And it was, in, I think, about, you know, the about skepticism about science and about GMOs and about, you know, all kinds of interesting stuff. So I highly recommend the article uh, not the article, but I highly recommend the interview that he had um, with her. So this story is awesome. Um, apparently, this went through multiple rewrites and multiple lawyers looking after it because it has like the greatest title ever. This comes to us from the Outline.com. It's by Yvette Detremont, and the title is "Chiropractors Are Bullshit. You Shouldn't Trust Them with Your Spine or Any Other Part of Your Body." Um, so this is a, a really great, great, great piece. Um, and so, uh, just to give you some context, here's a great paragraph from the article I'm going to be quoting now. If you're one of the approximately 80% of Americans who have suffered from back pain, you may have been referred to a chiropractor for medical help. In the modern day internet landscape, you'll find chiropractic celebrities like Dr. Josh Axe, 1.7 million Facebook followers. Dr. Billy DeMoss, 20,000 Facebook followers, and Dr. Eric Berg, 472,000 YouTube subscribers, giving advice that goes beyond managing spinal issues. Both in their offices and on social media, chiropractors have adapted to a marketplace that's demanding more than just pain management. They extol the virtues of an alkaline diet, tell you how to manage stress with detoxing, and wax scientific about the adrenal gland, which, last I checked, isn't in the goddamn spine. Though many patients rely on chiropractors to manage chronic back or neck pain, others delegate overall health maintenance to chiropractic care, to the joy of the chiropractic community and the possible detriment of humanity. Some chiros have gone as far as to adjust the spines of newborn babies, saying that this does everything from alleviating birthing trauma to stimulating the immune system to the point where the little ones don't need to get vaccinated, which should all make you wonder, does any of it work? No, it's absolute 
bullshit. And she goes into the history of chiropractic medicine. So chiropractic medicine was founded in 1895 by a guy named Daniel David Palmer. Daniel David Palmer was a magnetic healer in Davenport, Iowa, and the story goes that he met a deaf man who was a janitor named Harvey Lillard. Apparently, they had a conversation, and, uh, and Lillard's hearing could possibly be repaired by adjusting the spine. And with a crack of the back, the janitor's auditory woes were cured, and that comes from the piece. So it's a pseudoscience, um, and Palmer sort of developed his theories. He eventually set up a, a school, which is in Davenport, which is called the Palmer College of Chiropractic. Um, the yearly annual tuition is $34,000 a year, and, it's, and the acceptance rate is 100%. But there's another side story about this, which is absolutely fascinating, which is that Palmer apparently got a lot of his ideas about chiropractic medicine from seances and particularly he he allegedly had seances um, with a dead physician named Jim Atkinson and he wrote about it in his 1914 book The Chiropractor. I'm going to be quoting D.D. Palmer now. So this is from Palmer. The knowledge and philosophy given me by Dr. Jim Atkinson, an intelligent spiritual being, together with explanations of phenomena Principles resolved from causes, effects, powers, laws, and utility appealed to my reason. The method by which I obtained an explanation of certain physical phenomena from an intelligence in the spiritual world is known in biblical language as inspiration. In a great measure, the chiropractor's adjuster was written under such spiritual promptings. And so he developed an entire field of pseudoscience um, essentially based on his own sort of folksy understanding, guesswork, and hocus pocus, which is what um, Yvette de Tremont kind of calls it, and strongly held religious beliefs. Um, and it's not surprising. I mean, she makes a great point that, you know, in the 1890s, when Palmer founded chiropractic as a as a pseudoscience, medicine wasn't that great. I mean, people were, be were, were being given, uh, you know, uh, lobotomies. Um, people died of terrible diseases. You know, people died of what was called consumption, which we now call tuberculosis. People died um, of the, the, you know, of even just the flu. Um, so it, it's not surprising that, you know, D.D. Palmer, who was sort of selling the idea of being able to heal you with, with, you know, manipulation of the spine. And so that's the sort of the, the pseudoscience of chiropractic medicine. It's, it's, its foundation is built on this idea that there are what are called vertebral subluxations. And what vertebral subluxations are, according to chiropractors, are misalignments of the spine. And the chiropractor believes that by manipulating the spine and fixing these vertebral subluxations, that they can heal ailments within the body. And that's not just like lower back pain, um, but that's like, you know, uh, that's, you know, I've heard things from like, it can cure bedwetting, it can cure the common cold, allergies, you don't need vaccines, you, you know, cancer, you know, autism, brain damage, all kinds of things. Um, Penn and Teller did a wonderful episode of bullshit about chiropractic medicine in their first episode, in their first season. I strongly re recommend watching it because I think it, it gives you a good context about what chiropractic is um, and how a lot of um, the the connection of chiropractic movement to alternative medicine movement within the United States, particularly people like um, you know people like Dr. Axe. So like he he sells the idea that chiropractic medicine can reverse cavities that there's you know he also sells like special like health foods and snack things and um, and then there's Eric Berg and he kind of does the same thing and Eric Berg's big thing according to this article is adrenal fatigue which is this idea that the adrenal glands aren't working the way they're supposed to and so you have a problem with energy or whatever and you know the science on that is that that's just complete bullshit. Um, and it's just complete nonsense. But the person who she sort of covers is sort of a social media savvy chiropractor is a guy named Billy DeMoss. Billy DeMoss calls vaccine shots of pus. He thinks chemtrails are real. 
Um, he's pretty fucking wacko. Uh, and so th- th- this is kind of the thing we're dealing with here. Now, I want to stress that not all chiropractors are like this. There are some who are honest, who acknowledge that the scientific literature in chiropractic medicine, and there is some good scientific literature on chiropractic medicine, that does alleviate some minor forms of lower back pain. But it's important to stress that in doing so, you can get the same type of, of, of um, relief from lower back pain from a physical therapist or from a massage therapist. The other thing that's really terrible is that they treat children. And this leads to horrible, horrible things. There are multiple studies here in this article about um, people who uh, became paraplegics, people who had strokes. Um, there was even a Playboy Playmate who died um, I think a few years ago, um, who died of a stroke. Her name was Katie May. She died of a stroke um, because um, there is a vertebral artery dissection. Basically, there's an artery in your spine, and by manipulating the spine, they, they basically like cut um, or, or sliced open the artery, and that led to a disherniation and, and caused a stroke, and she died. Um, so, you know, this is, this is not shit to this is not shit to mess around with and she makes a great point in the article that you know chiropractic medicine goes out of your way and some chiropractors who are real snake oil salesmen they go out of their way to tell you all the risks of quote unquote western medicine but they don't go out of the way to tell you the risks with um, manipulation of the spine because there are real risks with manipulation of the spine particularly in the central nervous system as well as in the circulatory system it's a huge problem so What is the main takeaway here? The real main takeaway is that chiropractic medicine is complete and utter bullshit. It's nonsense. It was created by a total charlatan. It is based on nonsense and junk science and bad science and non-science. It's more of a religion than it is a, a actual legitimate medical practice. And it's sad that in the United States that some forms of chiropractic medicine are covered under health insurance. That's ridiculous. And, you know, if there was a way to be able to change that in public policy, I highly advocate for that. Um, And, you know, uh, kudos to Yvette Dentremont to putting this really great article together, exposing the nonsense that is chiropractic medicine. So that's it for the news items. Let's move on to Theocracy Watch. This comes to us from Jacqueline Williams at the New York Times. Australian Cardinal, an aide to Pope, is charged with sexual assault. Quoting from the article now, Australia's senior Roman Catholic prelate and one of Pope Francis's top advisors has been charged with sexual assault, the police in the Australian state of Victoria said on Thursday. The prelate, Cardinal George Pell, became the highest ranking Vatican official in recent years to face criminal charges involving accusations of sexual offenses. The case will test the credibility of Francis's initiatives to foster greater accountability after abuse scandals that have shaken the church around the world. What is going on here is there's a town in Australia named Ballarat, which is where Cardinal Pell got his start within um, the priesthood. It's a city in the the province, the Australian province of Victoria, um, where the cardinal was born, and uh, and where he returned after being ordained as a priest in Rome. And so um, the accusations are pretty pretty serious. So all of these came out of an Australian royal commission that looked into historical sex abuses within the Catholic Church in Australia, and in doing so, they found literally thousands of cases. Um, involving child sex abuse under the Catholic Church in Australia. And in this commission's report, they found that Cardinal Pell may be, allegedly, may be um, a perpetrator of some of these awful, awful crimes. Now, Cardinal Pell, I believe, just landed in Australia because he lived in in Rome. Um, He arrived uh, on Monday, so he arrived today. Today is July 10th, so he arrived on July 10th. Um, This is an article by Adam Badawi, and this is also from the New York Times. Um, Colonel George Pell returned on money to his native Australia, where he has been charged with sexual offenses, as a commission released a new trove of documents from its investigation into the Roman Catholic Church's past response to abuse allegations in the country. Cardinal Pell is 76 years old, um, and he was 
he was selected by Pope Francis to oversee the modernization of the that the Catholic Church's financial system, essentially its financial assets, um, which I guess had become fairly um, antiquarian. Um, so Cardinal Pell is one of the, the one of the leading Catholic leaders in the world, and the fact that he has been charged with historical sex crimes is pretty is a pretty big deal. I guess he testified earlier this year when the commission was first made public and denied charges. Um, he, uh, the thing that's interesting is the Vatican doesn't have an extradition treaty with this, with, with Australia. So Cardinal Pell didn't actually have to come back to Australia if he didn't want to, but he wants to clear his name. Problem is he's 76 years old. His health's not terribly good. So he had to travel in multiple flights in order to get back. Um, so I guess he flew from Australia from Singapore and he had to make multiple stops based on his um, doctor's um, orders. So um, he's denied the charges and the Australian government has special laws in place for historical sex abuse crimes. And that's what they're going to try to get him on. Um, because in the United States, it's very hard to... to um, uh, to prosecute people under um, sex crimes because of a statute of limitations. This Australian law, these Australian laws um, sort of get away and sort of bypass that. So just to give you some more some more hard numbers on the, what the commission found, I'm going to be quoting from uh, New York Times again. Quote, the commission has previously said that from 1980 to 2015, more than 4,000 Australians made allegations of child sexual abuse involving Catholic institutions, and that 7% of Catholic priests were accused of sexually abusing children from 1950 to 2010. And one of those is Cardinal Pell. But it's, it's, it's one of those stories where it's going to make irreparable damage to the Catholic Church. Um, I think that for as much as people like Pope Francis, and there's a lot of things, I guess, to like about Pope Francis, the fact that he's let somebody this controversial be at the top of the leadership within the Catholic Church is pretty distressing. Um, and, you know, Cardinal Pell is known to be very theologically conservative. So again, this is another case of do as I say, not as I do. And my hope is that we will get to the bottom of what exactly happened. If he's clear to the charges, he's clear to the charges. But it seems to me as if this commission has more than enough evidence to, to um, pin him to the wall. And hopefully they do. I mean, let's, let's find out what happens. You know, he could totally be innocent, but I think that the commission probably has enough evidence that would be particularly damning. So we're going to continue to follow this story. I guess he's going to have his arraignment towards the end of July. It looks like it's going to be like July 26. Um, he opened a peer, he appeared voluntarily because you can't be arrested under you know, historical crimes laws. Um, but but he, he, he came of his own accord to clear his name. So we're going to be continuing this story here in the podcast. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see what happens to Cardinal George Pell. Let's move on to our next story. This story comes to us from The Independent, and it's from our neck of the woods, Kentucky to allow public schools to teach from the Bible. Kentucky has signed a law allowing public state-funded schools to teach courses on the Bible. Governor Matt Bevan participated in the bill signing ceremony in the state capitol building, which opened with a Christian prayer. State Representative D.J. Johnson said the Bible really did set the foundation that our founding fathers used to develop documents like the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, local news station WDRB-TV reported. So the class would be an elective, not a requirement for students and each local school board has the option to offer the class or not. So some people have said that this is a huge problem. Uh, so uh, ACLU Advocacy Director Kate Miller said, quote, we want to make sure that teachers can teach and make sure they don't go in to preach. The department, like every state education department in the country, receives federal government funds. And so this is from the article. So this is a huge problem. Again, you know, and I've mentioned this on my on my Twitter page, and I've, you know, I've mentioned this in other places. Theocracy doesn't succeed overnight, particularly in developed countries. It creeps. In the United States, theocracy continues to creep, and this is one of the ways it does it. Um, one thing that's I think particularly telling in regards to this particular proposal is the fact that other religions have not been considered as a part of this 
bill. You know, in fact, the article actually says no other religious texts are included in the bill, which is set to go into effect on June 30th. Um, so we're living it now. It's the law of the land in the state of Kentucky. So Kentucky public schools can now create Bible curriculum and Bible classes um, that are not religious studies classes. They're, they are, you know, they're, they're essentially teaching Sunday school or, you know, an afternoon Bible study in a public school. And this is a huge violation of the separation of church and state, in my estimation. This is a huge violation of, I think, the First Amendment. And this goes against the very secular nature of our government, contrary to what's his fuck, uh, contrary to what's his name, uh, D.J. Johnson. Um, this country was not founded on Judeo-Christian principles. This country was founded on Enlightenment values. It was founded not on Moses and Abraham, but on John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and Hugo Grotius, and the other classical liberal thinkers of the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. So no, I don't think our government was founded on Christian principles. In fact, I think it's pretty clear from my reading of American history, particularly reading of Jefferson and of James Madison, that uh, they founded the government, and particularly the Bill of Rights, to avoid the very sectarian battles that they had seen in their history in England. And so, this is, again, this is just creeping theocracy in my backyard. I live in Indiana. You know, Kentucky is literally like three hours away. Not even that. It's like two hours away. And this is just absolutely wrong. And my hope is that um, somebody will challenge this, whether it's the Freedom from Religion Foundation or the ACLU, and hopefully it'll go through an appeals process and be overturned in the courts because it's absolutely ridiculous. There is no need to have an exclusively Bible-oriented class, even if it is an elective. This comes to us from the BBC. Saudi Arabia has clear link to UK extremism, report says. I'm quoting from the article now. The Henry Jackson Society said there was a clear and growing link between the Islamist organizations in receipt of overseas funds, hate preachers, and jihadist groups promoting violence. The Henry Jackson Society is a foreign policy think tank that advocates the robust spreading of liberal democracy, the rule of law, and the market economy. And for those who are listeners, the vice president of the Henry Jackson Society is the um, foreign policy scholar and journalist Douglas Murray. Um, Douglas Murray is fantastic. I mean, I think he's been on Sam Harris a couple times, and I think he gets the issue of Islamism and Islamic extremism pretty right in terms of what's going on within Europe and the potential for problems within the West in general. Um, he's written a book called The Strange Death of Europe, which I started reading. I think it's an incredibly prescient and timely book that I highly recommend people read to understand the issue of Islamism, particularly in the West, and, and how we as, as you know liberals actual liberals, you know, not the regressives who seek to um, sort of apologize for theocrats and for Islamists, but us real liberals, you know, classical liberals, who argue for secularism and human rights and, and tolerance, real tolerance, right? And so the argument here that Henry Jackson Society says is that, um, quote, uh, this comes from the article again, their report says a number of Gulf nations, as well as Iran, are providing financial support to mosques and Islamic educational institutions which have played host to extremist preachers and have been linked to the spread of extremist material. At the top of the list, the report claims, is Saudi Arabia, the UK's closest ally in the Middle East and biggest trading partner. So, yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is the huge problem that we face in, in the West, is that there is a clear link between Wahhabist Islamist ideology and ISIS and violent extremism around the globe. And the Saudis have denied this and they've, they've said that this report is completely inflammatory, but I'd like to actually see some evidence from them. Um, I think the Henry Jackson Society have been pretty thorough in their research of what's been going on in regards to Islamism and violent extremism in Europe. Um, and it's a real problem. And it's not easy to solve because of how connected the UK is to Saudi Arabia. It's one of their biggest trading partners and one of their biggest economic partners um, in general. And, and it, it's tough because Saudi Arabia is the world's largest oil producer. So in the United States is pretty connected to Saudi Arabia as well. In fact, we sell arms to Saudi Arabia. Um, and, you know, which have caused some, you know, civilian deaths within Yemen as, and, and, and uh, within other countries. 
And now that Qatar is being sort of isolated from uh, the rest of the Middle East because Saudi Arabia and Iran and other countries have accused them of um, of, of funding terrorist groups, which is you know a bit rich considering that Saudi Arabia, if the Doug, if um, the Henry Jackson Society is right, um, are putting money towards Islamist groups. And so I, I, I think that the fact the United States and the UK are so badly connected to Saudi Arabia is a problem. And if our country had more of a moral conscience, if it really wanted to value its own sense of American exceptionalism, it would do away or at least strongly curtail its connections to Saudi Arabia and the UK should do the same. Um, because regardless of whether or not you know, the claims that the Henry Jackson Society make are accurate, which I, I think they are. Saudi Arabia is the birthplace of Wahhabism, which is the, the codified ideology that has led to Islamic extremism around the world and Islamism. So again, I, I highly suggest you read this piece by the BBC and definitely check out the Henry Jackson Society um, formal report about this as well, which I've also read and it's, it's an interesting piece. Um, and I'll be delving, probably, I might be delving more into their report um, in the next podcast, because I think there's some really interesting points in there that the BBC article didn't get to. So that's it for Theocracy Watch. Now on to the special comment. Tonight's special comment is called In Defense of Journalism. The front page of the June 18th 1972 issue of the Washington Post, centered around the Nixon administration's efforts in North Vietnam, Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern's chances in the New York primary, and an impending U.S. appeals court ruling involving an airline pilot strike and its demands for stronger protections against hijacking. However, among the other articles on the front page, one became the most important, not only for that day, but for the ensuing two years. Five held in plot to bug Democrats' office here was the headline for an article by veteran Post reporter Alfred Lewis. Five men, one of whom said he is a former employee of the Central Intelligence Agency, were arrested at 2.30 a.m. yesterday in what authorities described as an elaborate plot to bug the offices of the Democratic National Committee here, Lewis reported. It was the beginning of the long national nightmare of the Watergate. A scandal so deep and so intricate that it took two years and multiple news reports, congressional testimonies, and a near impeachment to end. The linchpin that kept democracy safe against further abuses of the 37th president was a free press. The news. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein's subsequent reporting in the Washington Post blew the story wide open, took down a president, and made them legends in the process. A free press and unadulterated journalism pushed Richard M. Nixon to resign and for Washington to clean up what had gone so wrong for so very long. It is easy to make parallels from Watergate to our own times. Perhaps our White House's current occupant is as corrupt, if not more corrupt, than Tricky Dick. However, the chips may fall with regards to President Donald Trump's alleged collusion with the Russians. It was because of good, unfaltering journalism that we know about it, and a lot of it has come from the very same institution that went after Nixon, the Washington Post. As it is easy to mention Watergate, it is equally easy to trash the press. Many times they make it easy for us. When three CNN reporters recently went too early and played too loose with sources on a Trump-Russia story, they were asked to resign. Weeks later, CNN went after a Reddit user who had created a WWE-style SmackDown gif of Trump body-slamming a person with their logo over his face that the president later tweeted. The Redditor has since apologized and removed his original gif, but the news network wrote, quote, CNN is not publishing Han asshole Solo's name because he is a private citizen who has issued an extensive statement of apology, showed his remorse by saying he has taken down all his offending posts, and because he said he is not going to repeat this ugly behavior in social media again. In addition, he said his statement could serve as an example to others not to do the same. CNN reserves the right to publish his identity should any of that change. The last sentence, which sent shockwaves to the American zeitgeist, amounted to what some called blackmail. In fact, 
There was even a hashtag called CNN Blackmail, addressing their step of potential editorial overreach. I agree with the critics of CNN in concluding that its actions were extremely unethical, not to mention downright silly. Our country faces immense challenges, and you're wasting time and news copy on a person who goes by the name Han Asshole Solo? It gives Trump and all those who seek to undermine the press the very fuel they need to continue their crusades. CNN shouldn't have let it get to them and focused on good reporting and solid analysis. But it is cable news, so it doesn't always act idealistically. Despite its problems, a free and independent press is essential for the flourishing of our American democracy. Journalism is a bulwark against those who oppress, undermine, and disparage a free society. The post-inaugural success of outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post speaks to just how important the press is as an institution. They do get things wrong, but the difference between them and Trump, for the most part, is they own their mistakes. When the CNN reporters ran their Trump-Russia story too early, they apologized, retracted the piece, and left CNN respectfully. Imagine Trump apologizing for falsehood or complete fabrication. Pretty difficult to, right? The press will get things wrong. Doesn't mean they should be disregarded outright. It's pretty fashionable to disparage the media these days. It seems like everyone is getting on it, despite the fact that it is an indispensable part of our lives and social contract. The goal shouldn't be to abandon the press altogether. Rather, one should use critical thinking when reading a story. Read something a couple of times. Check the sources in the piece. If the article has hyperlinks, check on them and check out what they're citing. Read an opposing viewpoint. Read many of them. And most importantly, don't get too comfortable in your own bubble. We all have them. Puncture yours every once in a while and see if you'll learn something in the process. More often than not, you will. This issue, no pun intended, matters to me because I see the big picture in ways that others have not. I work with historic newspapers from the state of Indiana every single day. I've seen nearly 200 years of newspapers, from before Indiana was a state to just a few years ago. It gives me a broader and less cynical perspective. Papers back then were wildly partisan and got things wrong all the time. Some even told you their leanings in the masthead. Papers like the Green Castle Democrat and the Marshall County Republican let you know right off the bat just what kind of paper they were. It compels me, as an historian, to look at multiple papers about the same topic, to get a flavor of how people thought about it back then. People these days think that there was a time when news wasn't partisan. It was just about the facts. That's a load of bullshit. In reality, papers were incredibly biased and gave you just as much commentary as they did pure news content. That didn't mean they weren't important or weren't valuable. It just underscored how a free and open press will give you so many ways of seeing things. Your job as a citizen was, and still is, to separate the wheat from the chaff, the good reporting from nonsense. The reason we must be mindful of journalism's place in our society is that it is the very thing that can keep our country free. Watergate, the failures of Vietnam, Iran-Contra, the failed war in Iraq, and the alleged corruption of the Trump administration were all brought to light by journalism. They worked tirelessly and often thanklessly to get the story right. They fail, like all people do, but it shouldn't completely destroy our confidence in them. If we do lose that confidence, our civic life will fall apart. Thus, the founders believed that a free press lived at the heart of our American experiment. As Thomas Jefferson once said, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. I feel exactly the same way. That's it for this week of Reason Revolution. Please subscribe to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. If there's a platform you listen to podcasts on that I'm not on, please let me know and I'll try to make it happen. Send us your feedback at reasonrevolutionpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at The Daily Clark. Until next week, 
This has been Justin Clark, and this has been Reason Revolution.